Uh, oh, I have some follow up. Talk about the follow up, AJ. Oh yeah, here's my follow up. Check the show notes, heartlanded.com. Everybody check the show notes. It's for, important that everybody read the what? show notes. That's what's what the sponsors pay for. The sponsors pay per per impression on the show notes, heartlanded.com. Uh, to be clear, we don't have any sponsors as of this time. So if you're a sponsor, you have the opportunity to get your message read in the show notes. Um, or by AJ on the show. But the first thing the first thing the sponsors ask is what like what's your what's your page views on the show notes? Oh, that's true. I I guess I've never talked to any sponsors. So um, if you're a sponsor and maybe you wanted to sponsor us or you want to talk to us about what sponsors like, uh, definitely reach out to us. Uh, tweet at AJ. Yeah, but I like I called Nike. I was like, do you want to sponsor the show? Nike was like, well, how often do you plug your show notes of the show? And I was like, oh, I don't do that. And they were like, you need to plug your Twitter handle. Maybe. The reason we're not getting sponsors is all of our Twitter handles are so long and complicated. Not mine. Mine's not even my whole name. Mine's shorter than my actual name. Yours is so... How many L's does your Twitter handle have? Like 20? Two. Like AJ S-M-U-L-L. At least it. 25. That's my whole handle. I thought you had four L's. My goodness. Okay. Um, check the show notes. So, guys, should we go ahead and start talking about the Freedom Caucus? Ugh. Why the uh, so I, I'm the only one that feels this way clearly, uh, but I applaud the Freedom Caucus uh, and their moves over the last uh, week or so. So to be clear, I don't applaud everything they uh, do. Probably don't applaud most of what they do. But one thing that I liked is this week they stood up to Donald Trump, and uh, it was pretty wonderful because uh, Trump tweeted earlier this week, and I, I I don't know if you guys read all the news around this particular tweet, but apparently. Uh, the tweeting is under control now. And and by that, I mean they're using Twitter in a uh, deliberate way. So, you know, Bannon and uh, whoever the guy is that actually does the tweeting, because there's a guy. It's not Trump himself. He has a guy who types out the tweets. So whoever those people are, they're all like huddling together and deciding on what Trump will tweet. And And Bannon's, you know, trying to make these tweets as impactful as possible. And so they very deliberately tweeted uh, a thing saying that the Freedom Caucus better get on board or else uh, we'll fight them uh, and the Democrats. So just as an afterthought, the Democrats as well. But really, it's all about fighting the Freedom Caucus. And uh, I thought that was awesome in a way uh, that they said they, they kind of issued that challenge. And then the response for the, from the Freedom Caucus was, I thought, really, really hilarious. Uh, there were a lot of tweets from members of the Freedom Caucus Things to the effect of sometimes the swamp drains you, <laughs> which I thought was really good. Uh, then there was some other fun stuff. What is, oh, Mark Sanford. Do you guys know Mark Sanford? Have you heard of this guy? No. Who's that? Uh, yeah. He was the governor of South Carolina, and now he's the governor of being a uh, representative for the South Carolina <laughs> district number two. Yeah. So he went from, so, so this is, get this, right? So. He was the governor of South Carolina. Then I think he had an affair. and he, In Latin America. Yeah, in Latin America. So in Argentina. Using government funds. He fell in love with an Argentinian woman, AJ. And, you know, how Using dare, government money. Let's just not make fun of his love, okay? The bottom well, line. Well, let's make fun of his embezzlement of government money. Actually, I probably shouldn't use the word embezzlement in our show. I'm going to go to prison now. Um, did, he, did he embezzle or did he merely just like, I mean. I, I think he just misused it. He misused funds somehow. But in any event. Um, he went to, uh, he went to Argentina, his staff couldn't find him. This is years ago. Right. And then they finally, they, they said that he was like walking in the woods. Do you remember that? Like his staff was like, he's just out on a long camping trip and he was gone for like two weeks. <laughs> and eventually the South Carolina press, uh, you know, just kept on digging and digging and they, and then he announced that he was in Argentina and he was having an affair and blah, blah, blah. Oh, uh, yeah. He took yeah. the uh, – he was hiking, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said he was hiking, but in fact he was in Argentina. Uh, and so anyway, this guy obviously stopped being governor of South Carolina and you know was in the wilderness for a little while. Um, I don't know if he ended up marrying um, his, uh, his, uh, his uh, girlfriend, I guess, in, in South America or not. But the point is he's now a congressman. And so this guy is making fun of Trump. Like Trump is attacking this guy and he won't take it. You know what I mean? So you've got all these people that normally probably should be afraid of somebody like Trump 
and they're just not. And I think it just goes to the fact that like no president in history in such a little time has lost so much credibility uh, or basically ability to discipline their own part. I mean, and I think it's great. I think it's great because uh, that the Freedom Caucus is standing up to these people. Before we talk about the Freedom Caucus a little too much, uh, can I ask, so you're telling me that Trump's tweets now are uh, intentionally and thoughtfully formed? Well, by Steve Bannon. I mean, so put... Do, you, do we know this for sure? Yeah. I mean, that's what, that's what the New York Times has been reporting, that like the guy that runs Trump's Twitter, like that actually does the typing, has moved into an office with Steve Bannon. And so they spend their days and nights, presumably, thinking about what specific wording there is in the tweets. Because when Trump attacked the Freedom Caucus, the first thing that came out was, uh, you know, I'm sure leaked to the media that this wasn't just Trump being Trump. This was a tweet that people have been thinking about for like over a week. That's like more embarrassing than just assuming Trump did it. Yeah, like, I agree. The tweets are the tweets are good. Like, yeah. They're not good tweets. Yeah. And if you're like, if you if the message you want to get out to the press is that these not good tweets are tweets that we spend a lot of time thinking about and working on, like this is this is not the result of some like septuagenarian in a bathrobe. This is actually the result of of people, <laughs> you know, people working hard and really thinking about it. That's like worse. That's worse than full time. That's staffers. worse than that's worse than, than the bathrobe man. They should just say the bathrobe man does the tweets. Are these tweets still sent from Twitter from Android? <laughs> that I don't know. Oh my god, this is the biggest problem. So I switched from from uh, to, okay, cut this from the show. I switched from Tweetbot to Twitterific, and Tweetbot tells you what Twitter client was used for a tweet when you when you check the details, and it's I can't nice. figure out how to do that in Twitterific. Oh, so like since I switched apps, I haven't been able to know which Trump tweets are Twitter from Android. Uh, to give some background on that, Twitter uh, during the campaign, you could tell which tweets were from trump himself and which tweets were from the campaign partly because the ones from the campaign were like spelled correctly but also <laughs> the ones from the campaign were always twitter for iphone or twitter for web um whereas twitter for android was pretty reliably trump yeah almost certainly twitter for android was trump um i disagree with rigid about the freedom caucus why so there's 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 something that, that david froome calls uh the vichy mentality uh, Vichy, V-I-C-H-Y, basically the, the pro-fascist um, government in France during the Nazi occupation. It was called the Vichy government. And there's this this idea that, like, French conservatives were so excited about the spread of fascism um, or, at the very least, so resentful of French liberals that they were more willing to work with Nazis than with their own domestic opposition party. Um, so this Vichy mentality, the way David Froome defines it, the way David Froome defines it is we hate our domestic opponents, real and imaginary, so much that we collaborate with the foreign invader. So anyway, the the idea that like because the Freedom Caucus killed one bill that we don't like, uh, now suddenly they are good or did a good thing. But like the, the reason why they killed the bill is like very sad, right? Like they are opposition to the AHCA, which is a bill that uh would have thrown about twenty million people off of their insurance. Uh their opposition was that it didn't throw enough people off their insurance. Right. Like Paul Ryan failed to thread the needle of throwing the right number of millions of people off of their insurance. And that was the Freedom Caucus's objection. And I, I like I just don't think that's laudable at all. Right. Like, I think we got lucky that the, the GOP caucus is in total, uh, total chaos, but that doesn't make any of the factions in the GOP caucus good. And I don't understand how these things like healthcare deform that they want won't just come back. You know, like uh, what's stopping them from trying these things again? Um, a couple of reasons. One, um, you can only do I, I mean, you only can like muster the capital and the, the procedural requirements to do reconciliation, reconciliation bills every so often. Um, and the only way to get any health care reform past the Senate is going to be a reconciliation bill. And so they. You know, they, they want to. You can only have one reconciliation bill pending at a time, and they want to move forward with actually passing a budget. And so, at some point, they have to give up on other reconciliation bills. Um, so there are like procedural requirements why it had to be done fairly quickly, and there are also uh, political requirements because, I mean, the bill the bill is not popular. So, how much capital do you want to spend on a bill that's polling at seventeen percent nationally? I just don't think that we've heard the end of the healthcare deform story yet. Tom, I really like that. Did you make that up? Healthcare deform? 
Uh, it actually comes from uh, tort deform. Nice. So, um, uh, for for reference, uh, you know, a lot of the the reforms that Republicans have uh, uh, suggested for health care uh, are what they call tort uh, reform. It's actually not reform at all. It's it's a form of it's a deformation. I like that, Tom. That's good. That's good rhetoric. Yeah, I mean, I I think that like so. So this may be a good time for me to talk about one of my buddy's views on on the Ramayan, which is the uh, the great Indian epic. So uh, for the for those that are not familiar, the Ramayan is a is a great. I mean, it's kind of like an Indian. Yeah, it is. It's an Indian epic. And so is this, it like Beowulf? Uh, yeah, but more religious, perhaps, Tom. Uh, you know, than uh, than Beowulf. I think Beowulf is in. Oh, that's not true. It's probably in some English professor's religion. Uh, but. Uh, Effectively, what happens is is uh, Ram, who's the who is a uh, who's a king, gets expelled from his kingdom by by another king who takes over his kingdom. And I, I'm butchering the story a little bit here, but uh, the effect of it is the same. And so his wife gets kidnapped by this other king, and so he has he's sent into exile into the forest. And so while he's in the forest, he's trying to figure out how he's going to raise an army to to go rescue his wife and to go take back his kingdom. And one of the things that I think, you know, if you're reading the Ramayana or you're thinking about it, especially as a kid, it's sort of not surprising to you that Ram eventually wins because he's, he's a God. So of course he wins. Uh, But when you go through the details, and this is what one of my friends last night was telling me about, um, it's what he does is he actually wins by organizing a pretty rowdy band of, of people in the forest, people and things in the forest. So he makes allies out of monkeys. He makes allies out of trees, you know, and it's, it's obviously a mythology. So, you know, there's, there's a, there's kind of a, I don't know, a super, I won't say superhuman aspect to it, but you know what I'm talking about. Uh, And so it's through these alliances that he goes and he takes back power. And I think the democratic party, I think could learn a little bit from Ramayan for, for matter. Uh, they could learn that sometimes you need to accept alliances with people that, you know, you disagree with maybe on everything, but you like do trees. Have, uh, Republicans yeah. hate trees. Well, that's true. Um, and I think the freedom caucus hates trees, but you know, if they're willing to stand up to Trump, if they're, they're willing to stand up to fascism, they can be your ally. I mean, so basically the enemy, of your, your enemy is your friend, the enemy of your enemy. If you think of it that way, Tom, uh, if you think about how we partnered with Stalin, you know, in World War II uh, to defeat Hitler, you know, or uh, if you think of the people that partnered against Mussolini, I think Trump's actually more Mussolini than anybody else. But my point is that I think he's to... more Berlusconi than anybody else. Well, I think depending on how competent he gets, right? So if he's like super incompetent as he has been so far, then he's definitely a Berlusconi. If he gets a little more competent, you know, concentrates a little more power. Now we're talking Mussolini probably. I'm hesitant to say that the Freedom Caucus has actually done something good, right? Um, I, I just I just don't think that that people should be lauded on the left for having the sort of views that the Freedom Caucus have. Um, and you know, I guess I guess they got lucky in this instance that they were sort of less unpopular than the unpopular thing that they torpedoed but that doesn't that doesn't make them good that doesn't mean that they did like a good job they did a a, right like they had a good effect but with entirely bad intentions well i'm talking about the more narrow case of just responding to trump's attacks you know and standing up to him i'm just saying that like what's wrong with working with them on things like that where they challenge if they're willing to challenge trump's use of executive power or trump's use of of power period you know What's wrong with – and you know, we disagree with Trump, or at least I do, and I know you guys do. What's wrong with working with them when you can't? You know? like, do we need to demand complete ideological purity from these people or even some for that matter if they're willing to be allies on something that matters? So I think, I think there was a good point in there, which is that the Freedom Caucus seems to be better than most at how to message their opposition to Donald Trump. Um, but I don't know if that is something that the Democrats can take advantage of. Um, actually, this reminds me of a really interesting anecdote. Um, Thomas Massey, who is a representative from Kentucky and a member of the Freedom Caucus, he gave an interview to re, uh, 
to the Washington Examiner recently. Um, here's a reasons um, summary of it. Uh, he says, I went to Iowa twice and came with Ron Paul. I was with him at every event for the last three days in Iowa. For what I observed, not just in Iowa, but also in Kentucky, up close with individuals, uh, people that voted for me in Kentucky and people that have voted for Ron Paul in Iowa were now voting for Trump. In fact, the people that voted for Rand Paul in a primary in Kentucky were preferring Trump. All this time, I thought they were voting for libertarian Republicans. But after some soul searching, I realized that they voted for Rand and Ron and me in these primaries. They weren't voting for libertarian ideas. They were voting for the craziest son of a bitch in the race. <laughs> uh, Donald Trump won best in class, as we had up until he came along. Um, but, ba- but basically, like, like the, the Freedom Caucus's base are... Uh, I mean, at least according to this member of the Freedom Caucus, is people who just want to vote for a crazy son of a bitch. And I don't know that the left is going to be effective at at making deals with that sort of base, right? That like 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 it seems like the the Freedom Caucus have some potency when when attacking Trump because they are are coming from a similar base to Trump that they actually can influence the people that Trump considers his own people. Um, and the left don't have that, right? Like the left are are sort of enemies of the government. I mean, they're not just an opposition party in Trump's view, but they're actually like enemies of the government. And and I don't think that the the left can 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 reproduce the Freedom Caucus effectiveness in stopping this Trump initiative. Um. Yeah, I guess it depends on the initiative. I think everything that goes with executive power, I think, um, not everything, but much of what goes towards executive power, they can and. I mean, listen, there's people in the Freedom Caucus, you know, that are like very good on civil liberties, like Justin Amash, you know, uh, the, the the congressman from Michigan. So I, I think there's work to be done. And I'm not saying anything controversial. I know I think Democrats are thinking about that, but I think they're thinking about it more in a in sort of a nitty gritty politics kind of way. And I think maybe from a broader messaging way, there's an opportunity too. But um. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, where, where are you at on the Freedom Caucus? Good or well, bad? You know, my thought is, um, I mean, Richard, you say, you use these phrases like there's nothing wrong with working with them, right? I guess it depends on what you mean by that, right? So, you know, if you're a Democrat in the uh, Senate or the, or I guess the House, really, uh, if you're a Democrat in the House, w- what does it mean to work with them? Like, if you if you are just voting against something that Trump does, there's no need to, like, go and, like, you know, have a Democrats plus Freedom Caucus caucus, right? You can just vote your own way and know that they're going to vote their own way, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess you could probably get more done if you were willing to say, listen, we're, you know, this this policy is so unpopular that, you know, or so wrong that we're against it and the Freedom Caucus is against it, you know? It wouldn't it wouldn't kill the Democrats to to do that, you know what I mean? In fact, it might make them more popular broadly you know yeah well the other thought i had about that is you know there's never going to be a situation where the democrat well maybe not i i I almost certainly not going to be a situation where the democrats and the freedom caucus will be able to get together and say well here's a health care bill that the both of us agree on that both groups agree on so let's pass this instead of the bill that trump wants right like agreed (laughs) they're, they're just so diametrically opposed on that, that, that I don't think you can really work together in that sense. The other thought that I have on that matter is that, um, you know, when going into the Trump presidency and going into the Trump, uh, uh, campaign cycle, um, there are a lot of stories about how you shouldn't not normalize what Trump is doing. Right. And, uh, you know, so I, I think I'm hesitant to throw praise on on the Freedom Caucus because what they're doing, in my mind, is the bare minimum, right? And, and we shouldn't normalize or give praise to folks that are doing what they should be doing anyway, right? It's like, you know, oh, you know, I didn't beat my child today, so why don't you give me uh, a, a big <laughs> pat on the back? <laughs> Tom. I- I, I like a little bit agree with Tom, right? I mean, I don't know that that. Um, I mean, I don't even know that I would say what the Freedom Caucus did is the bare minimum, right? Because they still like their their opposition to the AHCA was that it didn't uninsure enough people, right? That that there still was a scheme that sort of provided assistance to some people to achieve health uh, to to access uh, or to be able to afford health care, and I sort of feel like that's not 
I, I guess I guess I have I have I have problems with any idea that that this is good, right? So the, the, like the two things you might take away from this is like one they killed the bad bill and that's good, but they didn't like I mean that that bad bill was dead in the Senate and also was pulling at seventeen percent nationally. So I'm sort of not worried about whether the bad bill was going to die or not. But second, um, it, arguably the politics would be better if that bill had gotten out of the House because then it could linger in the Senate and like really make a mess. Uh, so one, I don't know that killing the bad bill was like that much of an achievement because that bill was not good and it wasn't going to pass anyway. But second, like, I don't know that they're, they're, that, that the things that enable them to kill the bad bill are things that are reproducible from the left. So I don't know that it's a teaching moment and I don't know that what they did was laudable. Like, I sort of feel like we're just left with the empty, hollow feeling of, you know, living in America in 2017. I don't think it's that bad. I, I think they do deserve credit for challenging a president from their own party. That's hard to do, dude. You know, even if even if like Trump is, you know, a particularly weak president or whatever. But, you know, especially given like what Thomas Massey said, right, about how voters were, in, in his opinion, voters were voting for the craziest son of a bitch they could find, you know, uh, to say, OK, we're going to challenge the the intent of the voters there. I don't know. That takes some courage, you know. And I'm not even talking about just the AHCA because I agree that was like very, very unpopular. But I, I think there is an opportunity to work with these guys. I, and are there women? Are there women in the Freedom Caucus? Probably not. But uh, so, I mean, that's enough on the Freedom Caucus, I guess, until they do something else. OK, well, OK. So one last thing on the Freedom Caucus. Um, there's a there's a 538 article. Um, should the Freedom Caucus be afraid of Trump? And they they have um, twenty sixteen GOP primary performance of Trump in Freedom Caucus districts. Oh, nice! Trump did pretty well in quite a few of these, and did fairly poorly in quite a few of these. So I don't know what you can take from that. That's that's something that should be in the show notes, AJ. Heartlander dot com. Check the no shouts. No, check the <laughs> Tom. <laughs> The I, I think at the end of the day, these people know their districts a hell of a lot better than Trump does. And honestly, Trump threatens so many people on a weekly basis that he can't possibly follow up on the vast majority of these threats. Yeah, I guess so. Um, so one other topic that was uh, suggested by a loyal follower of our, follower of our the show and AJ's friend is the the what are the legal implications of publicly requesting immunity like Mike Flynn did? Oh, um, and I have a couple of thoughts on this, um, if you want to hear them. I do. Uh, first, uh, talking with some prosecutor and defense friends of mine, they are all taking the approach, it's a wait and see type thing, because almost every criminal they know, well, I, I should say every criminal defendant that they know asks for immunity, whether they have something to hide or, or, or whether they have something to offer or not. Um, so, you know, their opinion is, look, just asking for it isn't sufficient. They have to prop this guy, Mike Flynn, um, has to proffer up what, what, um, you know, he knows or not. And, and so, and, and I, I don't know if we even need to do this background, um, as, as to who Mike Flynn is and why he's asking for immunity. AJ. Mike, Mike Flynn. I mean, we've talked about this in previous episodes. Mike Flynn was the national security advisor to Donald Trump. He for about three weeks. For- yeah. For about three weeks, and then um, he had had some contact with the Russian government. It, it seems to be on behalf of the Trump campaign, but then he lied to um, Mike Pence about that, and then the whole thing was a mess, and he's sort of a weirdo. His son is super weird, but he is fairly weird. He led some locker-up chants at the RNC convention. Um, overall, he seems like a, he's weird. He's kind of a weird guy. He's weird compared to like others of us who are more normal than he is. Right. And and so his lawyer, it, him through his lawyers have, uh, I guess, uh, publicly made it clear that they're seeking immunity for, in, in their words, the story that Mike Flynn has to tell, whatever that story might be. So um, Trump tweeted saying Mike Flynn should accept or should get immunity. And this made me think, does he not realize that he can pardon Mike Flynn if he feels like it? <laughs> that's a good question because like he's like he still like acts as if he's like sort of a commentator you know not president of the united states when he's like man mike flynn should totally get immunity <laughs> um do you think this is what the, that was one of the tweets like uh, uh meticulously crafted by uh bannon in his closet <laughs> 
I think that was a 6 a.m. tweet. So I think the 6 a.m. tweets are, are, are all Donald. Nice. So the other uh, uh, note on this uh, whole Mike Flynn seeking immunity thing is there's been a couple of articles saying, look, publicly asking for immunity like this means that Mike Flynn doesn't really have anything to turn over or anybody to turn over, but is trying to bait congressional committees into giving him immunity in exchange for testifying. And this is based on the, uh, the Oliver North precedent. Basically, um, congressional community uh, committees gave North precedent. And then when the prosecutors in, in DC tried to prosecute him after the fact, because the prosecutors didn't give um, a North precedent, they took extreme steps to wall off any of their witnesses from information learned through the congressional committees, but was busted on appeal saying, look, it's impossible to separate that out. He was given immunity. And um, so uh, his, uh, that, that prosecution was busted. And so, uh, you know, the thought is maybe Mike Flynn is trying to do something similar in the sense that if he has done something wrong, he can um, uh, bait Congress into giving him immunity and get immunity and then testify and then be protected even without turning over anyone. Um, But my understanding is since um, Mike Flynn has asked for immunity, the congressional committees that might have given him immunity say no dice. Is that your understanding as well? That's... Well, I don't. No one. No one's taken him up yet, but that doesn't mean they won't. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I. I mean, I, I've heard that too, Tom. That Congress is not. Uh, at least the committees are not willing. Or oh, the other thing that I've heard is that this is just uh, kind of normal posturing. That anytime somebody like sort of like. That it would be basically malpractice for a criminal defense attorney defending someone like Mike Flynn to not ask for immunity as early and as often as possible. Sure, sure. But they don't have to ask for it publicly, right? They could yeah. – usually in, the, in these circumstances, what they do is privately go to the prosecutors who are investigating and say, look, here's a proffer of everything my guy knows under this rule of evidence that says you cannot use what I say in um, offering a, a, or negotiating for a plea mm. agreement to create liability. And so I'm, here's what I will, will tell you if you give me immunity. Um, and you know, you can say that and be completely protected from having that used against you. Uh, and you can do that privately because, um, usually prosecutors. So let's, let's play this out for a second, right? Um, the prosecutors are going after Flynn, not just to go after Flynn, but presumably because there are bigger fish they want to fry, right? There's, uh, you know, uh, people above Flynn, like the president of the United States of America, that might be involved in the bad things that Flynn was involved in, right? So if they want to go after a bigger fish, they don't want to make it public that they're going after a bigger fish, That because that gives the president of the United States of America power um, to destroy evidence, for example, to prepare his defense. Um, so what what they would want to do is to privately prepare this and quietly prepare this this uh, prosecution, presumably. Um, so, you know, by publicly doing this, they're not ingratiating Flynn and his attorneys are not ingratiating themselves um, in in these prosecutors uh, favor who they need if they want Im- they really want immunity. Right. Yeah, I wonder if this is I mean, I I try not to ascribe more competence to the Trump administration than, you know, they deserve, but I wonder if this is in some part of a ploy, right? Where they're saying, "Listen, Flynn's willing to testify for immunity, knowing full well Congress isn't going to give him immunity," you know? And then they say, "Listen, Flynn was willing to tell his story, you just didn't want to hear it," you know? I Well, there's another I, thing here too, right? Which is that Trump's whole idea is that this is a witch hunt and this is crazy. And then the tweet said that he should ask for immunity, not because there's any culpability, but because uh, this witch hunt is ridiculous. And it may be that Trump uses that opportunity to say, I'm going to spare, I'm going to grant Mike Flynn immunity. Yeah. Right? Trump can just say, I'll, I'll pardon Flynn. He'll tell his story. He'll testify. His testimony will be boring. And then Trump will say, I told you so. There's nothing to it. Um, yeah. Yeah. That could, that could be a plan. Um, and if they don't have that plan, I know they listen to this show. AJ, you've given them this plan. Trump, Donald, Donald, check the show notes. Donald, hit me up on Twitter. 
the show notes have the plan. Yeah. I mean, they have this very specific plan. If you're someone from the Trump administration and you've been thinking, damn, I just don't know how to do my job. Well, heartlanded.com has you covered. Our show, show notes, notes in the show notes. We have you covered. You're listening to this podcast every week. Um, we'll tell you how to do your job inside the White House. <laughs> <laughs> the other um, sort of uh, funny thing that, that occurred out of this story is um, – there were uh, after it broke that Flynn was seeking immunity. There were multiple sort of uh, uh, writers and 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 um, folks who found statements from Flynn during the campaign when uh, uh, associates of Hillary Clinton's got immunity, saying to the effect, "Look, the only reason you're getting immunity or you're asking for immunity is because uh, you ha- you're guilty, and everyone around you is guilty." So Trump did this too. In fact, like I was watching CNN yesterday um, in like the airport lounge or whatever, and they were showing a videotape of Trump saying, listen, folks, the only reason you ask for immunity is because you're guilty, guilty. <laughs> hmm. All right. Should we do everything we know about the Supreme Court? Um, sure. If you want. Uh, do we have any other uh, show type topics? I thought, we were, I thought we were trying to do an efficient show. Yeah. Let's go straight to the Supreme Court. Well, um, this week we only have one case really uh, to do or to predict, and that is Water Splash Incorporated v. Menon. Um, mm. So this is a case that actually come you know arises out of Texas, and the question presented in this case is: Does the Hague Service Convention authorize service of process by mail? And I know you you're thinking, wow, that sounds like the most boring thing ever, and it probably is. But um, I think there are a few wrinkles that make this case really interesting. I right? don't like and, wrinkles. Um, so you know, service for for the non lawyer folks out there service of process is when you file a a lawsuit you have to notify the person that you're suing hey i'm suing you and so the question is how do you notify them and there's various rules yeah twitter twitter Twitter. Twitter. Um, if you tweet at them hey hey actually if if you file a complaint in federal court we can link that in the show notes and then if if the other party listens to the show then you're good yeah well that's that actually is a, a form of process called publication um, you just have to get approval, uh, and there are several steps that you can take. But um, so, you know, what happens when AJ is living in Canada and I want to sue AJ in Canada? How do you sue someone that is um, ac- across international borders when you're dealing with international, uh, when you're dealing with Canadian law and uni- United States law, right? Like if I want to sue AJ who's living in Canada in state court in Texas, how do I notify him of that is, is sort of the question presented in this case. And, and it's actually exactly the factual scenario as well. Not AJ, but um, Menon lived in, in Canada and Water, Water Splash wanted to sue Menon um, in Texas court. Um, you know, the reasons are not too uh, interesting, um, except that they uh, Texas allows service of process of a, of a lawsuit complaint by mail. And this international treaty, the Hague Service Convention, presumably does not. Oh. Uh, the, the international treaty requires member nations to set up a central authority to serve documents and to provide proof of service. It does, however, say that the convention, and this is a quote, shall not interfere with the freedom to send judicial documents by postal channel directly to persons abroad. Now, elsewhere in the treaty, there's also language that tells you how you must affect service, which is not um, by mailing it to them, right? And so this conflict between, you know, the language that says the treaty shall not interfere with the freedom to send documents and later, and, and elsewhere saying this is how you affect service creates an ambiguity because you have you know two seemingly similar words and it, there's this canon of construction says when you have two sim, you know seemingly similar phrases but they're used in 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 different places in the statute the writers must have intended a different use right and and why why I like this case is remember how we were talking about you know plain meaning and textualism and originalism and how they can conflict and it's not just as simple as well, let's just read the text and see what the text says right um, the, the question, 
uh, in this case really is, did the drafters of this Hague Convention uh, intend for the word send to mean the same thing as affect service? And if so, why did they use those words, right? And so one side is saying, look, they did mean to, to, to uh, for send and affect service to have the same meaning. And the, the fact that they used a a two different words is what's called a scrivener's error, just a mistake on the part of the person writing. A because humble scrivener. A, a humble scrivener's area. Because, I have a quick question. Here's the here's here's the rub. The treaty was originally written in French. No, that's and my when question. They translated it from French to English. The French word addressar, or I forget. I don't know how you pronounce it. Was translated to send instead of effect service. Oh my gosh. This is awesome. I'm geeking out right now. Okay, I have a I have a quick question. So so with international. So just to give some background, with international treaties, they. There is often a an agreement about which translation of the treaty is the canonical version. So, um, I mean, you can say so. So you can have like a French, English, and German version of this trilateral treaty, and then say, but just so you know, the French one's the canonical one, right? Like that's the one that actually has the controlling language. So, so in this case, the French one, that's the actual treaty, right? The English translation is not official, or or at least is not controlling, right? Sure. I mean, is that true? I don't know. Oh. Um, but but what I what I can say is that the court spent a lot of time discussing the the word "send" in English and not necessarily w- what the the uh, f- the French treaty said. Because at, at the end of the day, remember the law of of the United States is the treaty that is adopted by the United the States United Senate. States, right? Yeah. And that's written in English. Okay. So, uh, I no, to the extent no that it's written in, um, to the extent that it is written in uh, uh, French originally, then um, you know, it doesn't matter. It does. It, it's well. It, it's not that it doesn't matter. It's just it. it it's more um, uh, persuasive authority than binding authority, right? Well, and, and and maybe if Scalia were on the court. He would say it didn't matter because um, international law doesn't matter to him, right? So, so going back, other question. Go ahead, it, AJ. So, is is there any concern about whether, like, uh, do, do you remember the Medellin case? It's about, this is about ten years ago, but in in Medellin, there was um, the the there was a criminal defendant who was on death row, and Texas wanted to execute him, and he had never um, been informed of his rights to contact the consulate during this time of arrest. And so the International Court of Justice said that his um, his arrest and, and prosecution were criminally deficient, were, were, sorry, were procedurally deficient and had to be redone. He needed a new trial um, and given access to his, to his consulate. And then um, but George W. Bush said, Texas, please don't execute him. And it went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, you really ought to you know, do whatever you want, Texas. Ted Cruz was the lawyer for Texas at the Supreme Court in this case. Um, the Supreme Court said Texas go ahead and execute Medellin, and then Texas did execute Medellin. But the case hinged on the fact that the treaty that the International Court of Justice was looking at was not – it was ratified by the U.S. Senate, but it wasn't self, um, self-affecting, self and Congress had never adopted any sort of enabling statute to make that statute effective in the U.S. So, so is there any situation like that with respect to the Hague Service Convention? No. Oh. The – so is the is the question really – well, go back to the question presented, Tom. What's the question presented? The question I, presented is does the Hague Service Con- Convention authorize service of process by mail? Is any of the question whether the Hague Service Convention trumps the laws of the state of Texas? Or is that not really at issue? Yeah, I mean it, it, it's not – necessarily that it trumps the the laws of of the state of texas right um it, it's that texas authorizes service of process by mail right and it, it's it's a question of whether the hague convention allows that process or not right because in one part of of the of the the treaty it says look in order to affect service you have to do x y and z right yeah. in another part of the service uh, of the treaty it says 
um, this convention shall not interfere with the freedom to send judicial documents by postal channels directly to persons abroad. Right. And so, you know, there's a reading of this uh, of the treaty where you could say, well, that's only meant to um, because they're using two different words. That's only meant to mean um, documents that are not service of process. Right. Um, right. So so in, in, in and just for background in lawsuits, a lot of times what happens, the original complaint has to be set sent in a very particular way pursuant to whatever jurisdiction that you're in or whatever court you're in in order to serve the defendant. But after you serve the defendant, the rules say, look, there are a lot of other ways. Once the defendant is notified of the lawsuit and has made an appearance, there are a lot of uh, and more simpler ways that you can notify the defendant of uh, pleadings that occur or things that occur in the lawsuit. And it could be as simple as sending them an email. I'm going to say 80 for the water splash. Okay, so you say 80 reverse? Yeah. Richard, may I recommend 80 reversal? So, let me, what did the lower court hold? Sorry, I'm, I'm still a little confused. So, the lower court was the uh, Texas Supreme Court. Okay. And uh, they uh, held in favor of Menon. Um, who is the person saying who is the defendant in in the case below saying look water splash didn't serve me properly in Canada oh I think it's going to be a 80 affirm and Kennedy the lover of international law that he is will be the person writing the majority opinion the unanimous majority opinion um, I agree with Richard I don't know who will be writing the the, the majority opinion though I do think it'll, it'll be an 8 affirm. Yeah, I think you can't have uh, – I mean this almost – this is probably the first case where I've been like, man, if only there was a world Supreme Court. Because can you have you know, a situation where you can send notices by mail in Texas, but you know, if you're somewhere else – Isn't that what the Hague is? Well, I, I thought the Hague oh, – I mean no, they're, they're not like a world Supreme Court, AJ. Well, and, and the, you know, the other wrinkle, and this all goes back to that discussion that we were having about originalism and, yeah. and textualism and like, how do you interpret these laws? Right. Because the other wrinkle in this case is in, in, in what they were talking about is, well, look, um, you have, um, you know, uh, and this is something that came up in oral argument. No, um, other court in, in the world has, um, uh, interpreted the statute the way that um, the folks for water water splash wanted it interpreted, right? And, but when it, so this was a question asked to the water splash attorney. You know how, how can you argue this to us when no other court in the world has made an interpretation of this statute similar to the one that you want us to interpret? And he was like, "Well, look, that's that is a question of how the process by which courts around the world." Um, interpret language because they inter European courts apparently interpret it a different way than the courts in the United States do. He was saying they have a different uh, set of canons of construction or a set of rules to interpret language that, you know, they're not as, and, and this is, I mean, almost literally what he was saying was they're not as textualist as the uh, United States is. This is super interesting. I mean, for, for many reasons, for all the reasons you cited Tom and, also because, you know, this is another thing where the interpretation here is going to impact, you know, thousands if not tens of thousands of, of pieces of litigation or potential litigation that would occur, you know? Because, you know, as much as we want to build walls, there's still going to be businesses in Canada doing business with businesses in America and America and Mexico and things like that, you know? So if you're a, gr if you're a farmer right now in Nebraska and you sell grain – uh, to some to some distributor in China, how how this sort of Hague Convention issue comes down could matter to you in a small way. I think you should be able to serve serve as a process by putting a copy of your lawsuit up on the wall on the big border wall. It's going to be such a big wall. You're going to want to put like flyers up or just like hey like help wanted or lost dog or whatever. But you could also just be like hey like. If you see Jim, can you let him know I'm suing him? 
Do you think it will be a crime to graffiti this wall? Because the graffiti could actually be, like, really interesting. I think it'll be a crime not to. Which side of the wall? Yeah, that's a good point, Tom. Um, I I heard recently that there was talk that Trump wanted to build the wall on the Mexico side of the border. Did you hear about this? I did hear about that. (laughs) The <laughs> like he wants to just annex like property in Mexico, I guess. <laughs> that is that that sort of caused the Mexican American War back in the day, but you know, that's just history. The past. Guys, I have a big problem. What's your problem? We've already got two decisions from the Supreme Court on cases we've done predictions for. And oh. the Supreme Court the Supreme Court got both of the cases wrong. As in they disagreed with you or with all of us? Because if they disagreed with the panel of three, then – of us, I mean, then obviously they're wrong. But if they agreed with me and disagreed with you, then it's not clear that they're wrong. Now, AJ, the other way to look at it is um, statistically speaking, of the two cases that um, the Supreme Court decided and that we predicted, only one person of the three of us got it right each time. So if we apply that to the current case, Water Splash v. Mellon, AJ – the Supreme Court is probably going to reverse 8-0. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to do you want to talk about these? Yeah, do you sure. just want to should we just make fun of each other or should we actually talk about the cases? Let's, well, I mean, let's at least yeah. at least make fun of each other and talk about the cases. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Yeah. I'm very I'm very angry about Expressions Hair Design v. Schneiderman. Can we do a reminder on what Expressions Hair Design was? V. Schneider, Schneiderman was Okay, so Expressions Hair Design one was the one about New York has this scheme where when you advertise, uh, when when you charge a premium for credit card transactions in your retail store, you have to advertise the the base price as the cash price, and you have to advertise the um, credit card charge as a surcharge on top of the base price. Right. You can't advertise yeah. a cash discount. You have to advertise right. a... Well, and, and more specifically, you have to advertise the base price as whatever the the credit card companies are going to pay, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, um, the apparently, Tom never told us this, the court below... Uh, provided, this is good. This uh, is good. AJ is is <laughs> learning from Donald Trump. He's blaming <laughs> other people. So Tom in this situation is the Freedom Caucus. Keep going, AJ. Tom, Tom never Tom never told us that the court below didn't even apply a speech analysis to the to the New York statute. And so, I mean, here we are talking about like, oh, is this commercial speech? Is it not commercial speech? Is it protected commercial speech? Is it not protected commercial speech? And the court below didn't even provide a speech analysis. So instead of actually ruling on the merits. The Supreme Court just said that uh, the court bo- this is commercial speech. It may or may not be protected commercial speech, and that you need to remand it to the court below in order for the court below to perform a speech analysis. Um, so, in a way, we were really telling the Supreme Court how they should think about this issue, because the listeners that we have over at that at that building. Uh, looked at it and said, "What the hell? There isn't even a speech analysis in here." <laughs> I, that, that's my point, right? Like, I, I mean, I was, I was firmly convinced that this is, um, uh, this impacts commercial speech, but in a way that is permissible. Um, and so the court, like, the court really took the first half of that to heart in a way that, uh, you know, like, I'm, I'm just glad the Supreme Court was checking the show notes. And I guess the other thing is, is that now the lower court has a lens through which to look at this problem. They don't need to just listen to what the Supreme Court said. They could listen to the show. Yeah. I mean, really, they could issue an opinion saying, see generally show notes. (laughs) Heartland.com. If you have questions, tweet at AJ Small. So the other one. Five L's. uh, (laughs) The other other one that we have a decision in um, was Andrew F. V. the Douglas uh, Co. County, Douglas County School District. Um, oh, yeah. And- this was the really important case on, like, what dis- what what sort of you have to do for kids with uh, uh, with, a, with a learning disability. Yeah, it, the level of educational benefit that school yeah. districts must um, confer yeah. on children with disabilities to provide them a free and appropriate education. And, Is it a check uh, the box, or do you actually have to do it? And uh, ju- so Judge Gorsuch thinks that the standard is that it must be merely 
excuse me, that the standard must be merely more than de minimis. And the Supreme Court said, well, ho, ho, it has to be more than de minimis, not merely more than de minimis. And that was an eight over reversal. Yeah. Bam. AJ got that one wrong, too. <laughs> got that one wrong, too. What but you know who else got that one wrong? Ruchit and Judge Gorsuch. <laughs> wow. Let's, okay, so between me, Ruchit, Tom, and Judge Gorsuch, only one of the four of us made law review, and that one of the four of us <laughs> also got the case right. <laughs> and that one of the four of us, actually, I guess, and that that's the one of us that's not being nominated. Well, I guess neither AJ and I aren't being nominated either yet, but. No, but soon, someday. Uh, someday. Uh, I look forward to, to discussing this these issues with Judge Gorsuch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe with neither of us on the court, but I think he's actually going to end up on the court. I, I look forward to uh, testifying in your confirmation hearing against you, Ruchit. <laughs> Dude, that was so wrong. Because now... Because now, even if I, even if you decide to testify in my favor, they're going to play this part of the show. And they're going to say, you said you were going to testify against. What happened? My, uh, my testimony will be uh, uh, interlaced with clips from the show and references to the show notes. <laughs> uh, okay. I have such so, a good sidebar. Yeah. What's your sidebar? Oh, I don't have a sidebar this week. Oh, oh my gosh. Rooch. I thought Rooch. I'll give you a Rooch, you can, you can use my sidebar. After I do it, you can do it too. Okay, go. Okay. I can also um, do two sidebars. So there is um uh J- Jimmy Kimmel Live. Jimmy Kimmel um has a t- has a late night talk show host uh show and and uh there's a, a on YouTube there's a clip Donald Donald Trump moves stuff around and it's just a supercut of every time Donald Trump sits down at a table, he immediately starts rearranging the papers. And things in front of him, like he moves his water glass a little bit. He just seems to be like a little bit of a fidgeter. But the clip is like very funny. Like sometimes he's moving other people's glasses around. Um, and uh, it's good. It's very good. It's very funny. Nice. Check the show notes for that link and watch the video. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Read it, AJ, after you've watched the video. Uh, to let him know thoughts. what you think. Yeah. Um, my, uh, sidebar is, uh, you guys know George Takai. He, um, uh, is an individual who, uh, became famous for a small role, recurring role he had on a small TV show called, uh, Star Trek. Um, I'm sorry? Star Trek. Excuse me. I don't think I've heard of that one. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it was a tiny, tiny show, but since Star Trek, he is, um, sort of very, uh, you know, politically active in the sense that he's, he, he speaks out, speaks his mind. Um, and he's pretty eloquent when he speaks his mind about, uh, uh, some issues. Um, so he ends up getting, uh, passed around as a meme sometime, things that he says about certain political issues. Uh, but last night he tweeted that he is, uh, the cat's out of the bag, that he is going to run against, um, uh, David Nunes, uh, for Congress in 2018. Against Devin Nunes? Um, is it Nunes or Nunes? I don't know. I can't pronounce anything. <laughs> Uh, wow. So that's awesome. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, and, and he is, uh, he's a, a pretty popular individual, I think, um, you know, just from his, his, uh, history and, and he's also a very articulate individual. So this might be a real challenge that, uh, Nunez has. Um, I have a question. Has there ever been a member of Congress who was, um, uh, who has moved to concentration camps in the Japanese internment because Takai was, but I don't know of any other member of Congress. Well, he's that old. Yeah. Takai was interned during Japanese internment in the forties. What the, he was like, he was like a small child. So he's like 70 or something. Yeah. He's like Donald Trump's age. Wow. That is amazing, man. He's 79. I, I think he's running as a Democrat too. Just a hunch. Oh, I'm seeing – maybe it's an April Fool's joke? Oh, this is terrible. No, I'm not running for Congress. Happy 4-1. This is terrible. Ugh, that was horrible. Wow. I shouldn't have Googled real time. Sorry, Tom. It's That's okay. like a really disappointing sidebar. It, it, it hurts my heart. The, um, I was getting excited. Okay, so my sidebar 
is that Google has this really cool new device called the Google Gnome. Have you guys heard no. about the the Gnome? It's a, it's this, a this is like an April Fool's joke, right? AJ, way to ruin my my okay my sidebar. I'll, I'll edit it. here. Just start from the beginning. I'll edit it so that you did a good job, dude. Guys, Google has this thing called Google Gnome, and it's it's to, it's so you can have a smart yard. Okay, so it's this gnome looking device that you can ask things like what's the wind speed, what's the difference between a circocumulus and Kilmanimbus cloud. Which way is the wind blowing? Um, it can play fetch with your dog. Uh, it integrates into your lawn mower, so you can smart lawn, smart mow your lawn. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, you know gear that goes around with it. Uh, there's a there's an accessory that turns it into a bird bath. It's it's pretty awesome. That's my uh, cool. Check out the Google Gnome. It's in the show notes. I'm watching I'm watching the YouTube right now. Doesn't it look um, amazing? Can I do another sidebar and we can we edit out the the sidebar that uh, no, was dude. horrible? No, no, no. We're keeping that. Uh, I have a good sidebar. You can you can talk about it, but we're keeping the other sidebar. <sighs> That's the worst. This must be. Okay, give me give me the... give me your new sidebar, dude. No, no. If we can, if we're not using it, what's the point? Why no, we're gonna it? we're gonna use them all. We'll use this sidebar as well. You'll just have two sidebars. Yeah. Well, so this there's an R's. Technica article that was released yesterday about um, how libraries have sort of um, gotten a new lifeline as they become sort of the uh, broadband lifeline for a lot of the people in their community. So folks in their community go to use um, internet um, that otherwise don't have internet. And, you know, because what I like about this story is that, um, you know, uh, normally we hear about how libraries are in decline and nobody goes and reads books and all that kind of stuff. But um, this is another example of uh, libraries adapting to the time. And I'm optimistic that libraries will be around for a long time. I am too. I mean, I actually go to the library and I, I, I've been going to the library for several months now. And I once thought, Tom, as you did, that libraries were in decline. And now, now that I go to libraries, there's a lot of people in these, you know, and they're not just using internet. They're getting books. Like for all you read on the internet about how nobody goes to the library or read, read physical books. Richard sidebar. Richard sidebar is that books have libraries. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and people go to the, libraries and people oh go God. to them people go to libraries have you seen have you seen this crazy youtube video it's a youtube of of a building with books in it people are getting the books but later they bring them back to their homes the, that's my sidebar dude there was a uh there was once a netflix for books and it might still exist but people were just like dude you're basically charging 15 dollars a month for a library <laughs> <laughs> um Well, guys, I have to go. Um, Why? Because uh, it's 10 a.m. in New York City. Don't you hear the siren in the background? Yeah, it's uh, I've, I've, it's 10 a.m. and I've got to I've got to go eat some brunch, dude. Dude, there's a great gr- great brunch place here. Must be nice. Must be nice for you to sleep in until 9 a.m. Go and eat brunch, dude. I was out late last night. I'm gonna stop talking to you. Also, why? I don't want to talk to you in the podcast anymore. <laughs>